Okay, so good evening and welcome to the Demography Today lecture series. Um, this is sponsored by the VVVA Foundation and co-organized by the Spanish National Research Council and the Lompoc Project, which is uh, funded by the Horizon 2020 program. Uh, today we have here a George Altel. Welcome. I thank you very much for uh, accepting our invitation. Um, George will deliver a lecture called Income, Disability and Old Age Mortality Among Early 20th Century Railroad Retirees. Uh, George is a research professor in the Institute for Social Research and also professor of history at the University of Michigan. His research integrates theory and methods from demography, economics, and family history with historical sources to understand demographic behaviors in the past. From 2007 to 2016, Alter was director of the Interuniversity Inter Consortium for Political and Social Research, the world's largest archive of social science data. And he is a past president of the Social Science History Association. He has been active in international efforts to promote research transparency, data sharing, and secure access to confidential research data. He is currently engaged in projects to share longitudinal data in historical demography, to automate the capture of metadata from statistical analysis software, and to compare facility transitions in contemporary and historical populations. So again, thank you, George. Uh, normally, the lectures uh, last one hour, so you have more or less one hour. Mm -hmm. And then we will uh, open the floor for questions. Thank OK. You. So um, th thank you. This is, a, uh, this is actually a brand new paper. This is the first audience to see these results. Um, I'm working with uh, my uh, friend and colleague, Sam Williamson, who's at uh, Miami University and the, the Measuring Worth Project. Um, so here's what we're going to do. We're going to look, uh, I'll talk just a little bit about health disparities and, and retirement, um, which is the context of this. And then I'm going to talk, give you an overview about uh, where the data come from, from the Pennsylvania Railroad re Retirement uh, Program. And then we'll look at some of the earnings and occupations data and um, some data about our early retirement. And then we'll get to the, the data about uh, mortality and, and income. So, um, there's been uh, a, a lot of uh, discussion and research on uh, health disparities, and I'm not going to summarize it here because some people in the audience know it much better than I do. Um, but there's been a question you know, that emerged in, in the last 50 years in modern societies with national health programs and, and high incomes. Why is health still related to mortality. And um, so it's, you can measure it by income or, or by uh, socioeconomic status, but one would think that these disparities would disappear, but in, some, in a number of the advanced countries, they've been very persistent. And um, you know, why does income matter for health when you're at high levels of income? How, do you, how does someone buy better health? Um, are there, you know, what's the role of, of medical care in, provide, in, in these things? What's the effect, are some of these effects uh, due to stress um, and, you know, of people with different incomes or different kinds of occupations? And finally, what's the contribution of, of lifestyle? So I'm not going to be able to answer some of these things, but I hope that by providing another uh, data point from, an, from a century earlier, we might eventually be able to come to s some understanding of, of some of these things. One of the, uh, there is actually an additional debate about when health disparities have uh, emerged. Were there always health disparities? Did, the, did uh, wealthier, higher status people always have longer lives? 
did, some people argue that there was uh, a convergence and then a, a, a divergence, uh, possibly. Um, there's a very interesting paper that I heard uh, a few weeks ago by uh, Martin Drieber and Bjorn Eriksson uh, about using data from Sweden that actually finds in the late 19th century in Sweden, the highest status people, uh, men had higher mortality, which is sort of surprising. And, and that actually, that result supports uh, a result from, by uh, Tommy Bankson um, that uses a different data set and gets the, gets the same results. So there actually is some, uh, quite a bit of doubt about what the, the pattern of uh, health disparities has been over the last uh, two centuries. And we're going to add uh, a little bit of uh, a, another data point on this. So the, the Pennsylvania Railroad data has um, a number of interesting characteristics. First of all, it's, it's uh, a data set about mortality over the age of 70. Um, and it's not that easy to get mortality uh, at older ages because the numbers are often small in local area studies. Um, secondly, it covers the period 1900 to 1920, which is a period in which medical interventions uh, are not particularly effective. This is the era before uh, antibiotics, before other kinds, uh, most uh, medical interventions. Um, and um, one of the other really interesting things about um, the Pennsylvania Railroad data is that the, it was, the railroad was a very big company, uh, one of the largest, if not the largest, in, in the United States at the time. And it has a full range of occupations. So we're not just looking at one occupation, but as you see, we have occupations uh, all the way up. And in addition to the occupations, we have uh, income data, uh, which is very detailed, which is also very unusual. So um, what we're going to look at is, uh, um, let's see. So we're also, in addition, going to look at uh, some evidence about retirement. And uh, the question here is really about how do in incomes and job characteristics relate to retirement. Um, in, in fact, uh, it's impossible with this data set to do, the, to do research without looking at uh, the retirement question as well as the other. Although the, the railroad required people to retire at age 70, we find that they also had a special provision for, for younger retirement. And um, this is a, another interesting aspect of the data. This is in the United States, this is one of the, the earliest uh, pension schemes for a, for a large company. Um, it has both voluntary and involuntary retirement. Uh, and again, it has a broad range of, of occupations and very detailed data about, uh, about incomes. So let me tell you about the Pennsylvania Railroad. So the, the Pennsylvania Railroad was one of the largest in, uh, companies in, in the United States. It covered, the railroad covered a large area in, in the northern uh, United States. And it was also a company that was very progressive in providing benefits to the workers. This wasn't uh, totally altruistic. They're also trying to avoid uh, unions and others from, from uh, uh, doing things that, that uh, they don't want, but they, in, in the 1880s, they started a, uh, uh, a health benefit program. And then in um, the, the 1890s, they, started, they decided on a pension program. And the pension program had a number of characteristics that are uh, very important to, uh, to know about. The first is that they that it required mandatory retirement at age 70. So everybody in the company had to retire at age 70. And you'll see it, it includes people who are very well-paid executives. Secondly, uh, workers who had 30 years of experience 
uh, if they were physically disqualified, could retire as early as, as age 65. And as you'll see, quite a number, uh, quite a number did. Um, and the, this early retirement could be requested either by the employee who wanted to retire or by the uh, supervisor of the employee in cases where there was someone who was obviously not able to uh, keep up with their job. Um, and as we'll see, the requirements actually changed over time. The company became somewhat more generous and allowed more people to retire early uh, over time. Um, pensions were, were uh, determined by a combination of earnings and length of service. So the formula for pensions was that um, it was 1% of the average earnings in the last six years before retirement for every year of service. So if you uh, served for 40, for 40 years in the company, you got 40% of the, the salary that you were making in your, in your last six years. And as you'll see, they, the workers were the, worked for the railroad for a long time. Um, but because they use the earnings in the calculation of the pension, we have very good data on how much people were earning at the end of their careers. So we know that uh, uh, very well. The retirement program went in, uh, lasted into the 1930s when, for a variety of reasons, a number of uh, retirement programs in the, the American railroads uh, were, ran into trouble and the, uh, they were consolidated into, under, um, into a national railroad retirement system uh, by acts of Congress. Um, we don't have data for the whole period, but we, we, only ha we have data from the period 1900 to, to 1920. Um, and we have individual level data that tells us about when people retired, what their average earnings were in the last six years, what their pension was, uh, and if they died before 1920, we, we know their, uh, their date of death, and we have uh, occupations often both from the occupation that was reported when they retired and the, uh, an occupation on, on the death certificate. Um, so here's the, the data we have. We can follow uh, 10,000 uh, retirees. Um, I believe that the data we have now is all, is all men. There were a small number of women in, in the system, but I don't think we have them in this, in, in this data set. And about half of them died in the period that we observed. Remember, they're mostly retired you know, retiring at age 70, and the ones who were retiring before that are, uh, are often uh, ill. Um, and so we have, for each of them, the average earnings, and there's the, there's the formula for uh, uh, computing the earnings. There was, they got a minimum of $15 per month, but the, uh, the, the pension is based on uh, length of service and, and final earnings. Um, we've taken these annual earnings and we've adjusted them to remove uh, inflation uh, by comparing them to an index of the wages of industrial workers during this period. Um, uh, the reporting of ages is, is really important here, especially for the elderly. Uh, it's often the case that we have very poor ages, re age reporting for the elderly. In this data set, it looks pretty good. Uh, that's uh, largely because the ages were reported mostly when the, when the employee was hired. So um, if you get ages reported you know, later, they can be misstated. Um, there certainly could have been uh, an incentive for some people to report themselves at, at a higher age in order to take the pension or to report themselves at a lower age so that they could keep, keep working. But the railroad was following, it kept dossiers on everybody for a long time. Um, on the other hand, you should know that in the United States, we did not have very good, we did not have uh, 
birth and death registration until the 20th century. So it's, you know, it's entirely conceivable that a lot of these men didn't know exactly when they, what their age was or that they changed it and there were no documents to prove them wrong. Um, I suspect that this is mostly a problem in 1900, whereas you'll see a lot of people retire because everybody over the age of 70 had to retire. And you know, if someone looked like they were 75 or 78, you know, what's the difference from the point of view of the company uh, at, at, at that point? But um, one of the good things about the data uh, is that we do not see ages of death that are outrageous. There are some ages of death in the 90s, but we don't have a, a single age of death over 100. And often that's what you see in data sets where the ages are exaggerated. You see very high ages of death and, and, and that's not here. So the ages of death are, are in general pretty good. So first I want to talk about the earnings and occupations and show you that the uh, railroad covered quite a, uh, a diverse uh, population. So here is, uh, here you have you know, numbers of retirees uh, by different occupational groups. And, and the railroad had a lot of different occupations. There are professionals and managers, supervisors, uh, engineers. Uh, engineer in this context means uh, someone who drove a train. Um, there, there are also pilots and, and, and captains because the railroad owns some, some ships and ferries. Um, there are conductors, there are sale agents, there are clerks, there are a whole variety of watchmen, uh, and then many um, skilled workers like machine builders and painters and carpenters and, and so on, and then just plain laborers and, and other <coughs> occupations. Um, here I've superimposed on the, uh, the uh, uh, numbers of, of workers the the average income of workers in that category, and you can see there's a tremendous difference. Some of the, the average uh, earnings of the uh, professionals and managerials, managers was up near $350 a month, and it's down around 30, uh, 20 to 30 for the, uh, some of the laborers. So there's quite a diversity of, of, of incomes, which I'm gonna show you more, more about. So um, this is a slide that, with a number of different characteristics of these workers, you can see the amounts that they were getting for by monthly wages, the average age at which they were tired. Um, but it's uh, especially interesting. And so a couple of things to, that I wanted to point out. Um, first is that you do have these, you know, executives and professionals of the company. I think there's an architect or two in there um, as well. Um, secondly, these workers worked for the company a long time. The, in order to qualify, they had to have worked for 30 years, but you can see that um, the average is well above 30 years, and many of them had worked for the, for the company for, for more than 40 years. Um, and I, uh, I'm going to come back to some other elements. So this is what the incomes look like for these occupations. And um, uh, I'm, uh, I think I was really impressed that this actually turned out so well, because you can see each of the different occupational groups has a, has a, a modal income at a, at a different place. That, uh, and they just sort of move nicely to the right. At, at the very end, there's these professionals who some of whom are, are extremely well paid, and I've grouped them. Um, I will point out that the axis here is in $10 groups up to 100, and then it, it, it's collapsed, so it's, it's, for, it's shortened. Um, there are two occupations that I want to call attention to because they show up in, in later things, and those are the conductors and the engineers. And as you see here, so these uh, are ex extremely well-paid men. Their uh, incomes are uh, 
are uh, above the, the, the normal skilled workers like the machinists and the painters and, and, and so on. And of course they had very high responsibility because they're responsible for the trains while they're in, while they're in motion. Um, there's also an, another interesting, a couple of interesting groups here that uh, I wanted to highlight here. And these are the, the clerks and the agents who are of course white collar and the supervisors. And what's in, what I find interesting about them is that, you know, if you look over here, um, the, the mode for their, for their income is very similar to the mode for the, the uh, skilled workers, but it has a, whoops, it has a, a, a fatter tail over here. And I think what's, What's interesting about a number of them, especially about the supervisors, is, is that those were probably men who started out in other occupations and were promoted. And when you look at the, the individual level data, you see that there are supervisors for all sorts of things. And some of them are higher paid than others because they're related to whatever it is that they're supervising. So they're supervising machinists and they're supervising uh, men supervising laborers and watchmen. So there's quite a diversity there. And basically they, they, uh, did, they could rise through the ranks to get supervisory responsibilities which gave them incomes like a skilled worker and in, and in some cases e even more. But then you also see over here that the, the professionals are just getting a higher income than, than any of them. Okay, so I hope I've uh, convinced you that this is uh, an interesting population to look at um, and that it's very diverse. So now we're gonna look at, at early retirement and what's going on here, is, uh, I think you'll see, is that retirement is being affected both by income and by health. Um, and also that implicit in the decision to retire early is a trade-off between income and leisure. Um, and that seems to change and be affected uh, in different ways. So um, this is the distribution of retirements by year. And you see that, um, of course, you know, over 1,000 men retired in 1900 when they entered introduced the program, because in that year, everybody who was 70 or older had to retire. Um, so that drops down. But the other interesting thing to notice is that there is an, uh, you know, an increasing trend overall, but what really increases is the voluntary retirements. So these guys here in, in the, at the bottom in the blue are retiring at age 70, and that group is increasing slowly. What's increasing more rapidly is this red area, which, is, which are the men who, are, uh, who asked to retire early between 65 and 70. And then there's a small group you know, that's about roughly constant of men who are, uh, whose retirement was initiated by their supervisor. And we'll see a little bit more about each of these groups. So this is um, the distribution of uh, the proportions of each of these groups uh, of retirees by uh, the income that they got before retirement. And um, so the ones at the top are the ones who retired at age 70, but you can see that, that it's a very you know, irregular pattern. It's got two different uh, modes in it, and it's driven, you know, the changes are driven by the, what happens in terms of voluntary retirement. Um, so a couple of things uh, to notice here. The first one is that the men who are being asked to retire by their supervisors are often the, uh, the lowest paid workers. They're, and we think that what's going on partly there, the reason, part of the reason that they're low, lower paid is probably because they're not working full time. Um, but, and 
it's clear that in some of those, that in a lot of these cases, they're not working full time because their, their health was bad. So they're concentrated at, at the very lowest uh, incomes. But then the proportion who, who retire voluntarily increases and then decreases. And um, this is uh, the thing that that's harder for us to, to explain, but what we see here is that if you're looking at the manual workers, the better paid manual workers, the more they were paid, the more likely they were to retire um, up to a certain point, and then you get to the, the high status white collar workers, and um, they're less likely to retire. So that's the, the, so the employees are up here, and, and retirement actually, uh, uh, they, uh, make it to age 70 and, and are less likely to retire early. So this is, a, uh, this is the distribution of average incomes in each of those groups. The dark blue line are the ones uh, uh, who retire at age 70. And then again, the, uh, the, so the, and the green line are the ones who were requested to retire by the supervisors and the red line is the one who, ones who uh, retire at the employee's request. And you can see here, it's got this bulge that the other two don't have. And it's, it's at the high end of the skilled workers' uh, incomes. And um, as we'll see, that bulge is largely due to the conductors and the engineers, who are exp uh, especially unlikely li to retire. So, so I'm going back to the slide I showed you before with these various characteristics. And I want to draw attention here to the engineers and the conductors. They are, on the one hand, uh, very well paid for, uh, for, for workers. Their incomes are above the, the, the average for, for skilled workers, which so you can see here that the, the skilled workers are, are making an average $50, and the cl clerks are making $60, but the conductors are up here at 70, uh, and the engineers at 80. Um, and they are especially likely to retire. They have the, the highest proportion of any of these occupational groups who retire before age 70. And, uh, but right above them, the professionals and, ma and managers are less likely to retire. So this is you know, repeating what we saw in the last slide, but, it's, um, uh, but focusing on this particular group. Um, so anyway, the, what I've shown you is that the early retirement did become more common after 1910. Um, and when we look at the trade-offs between income and health, um, it looks like early retirement among the lowest paid workers is really related to health. Those who, who are making uh, less than $20 a, a month were probably, uh, a lot of them were probably unhealthy, and certainly the ones who were asked to retire by their supervisors probably in that category. But uh, you know, the tendency to retire early sort of increases with income up to a peak around uh, $80 or $90 a month, um, and that peak is, is partly driven by the conductors and, and engineers. So in this, in, among those, it seems to be not driven by health so much as by the choice to retire early. And finally, the really well-paid people, the, the high white collars and, and the professionals, um, choose to make the other decision. So we get this, this uh, two-peak distribution distribution. So now I'm going to turn and uh, talk about income and uh, mortality. And what I'm going to show you are results from <coughs> uh, Cox regression models. So um, this is a, these Cox proportional uh, uh, hazard models are a way of uh, parameterizing, um, uh, doing regression models of mortality. And what we're studying here is um, what are the, the variables that affect uh, the time until, until death. So here is uh, 
let's see. So first I want to show you um, the, the relationship between um, mortality and income. And in these uh, models, we're looking, what we measure here is the relative risk associated with a change in, in that variable. And a, a relative risk above one means that that variable increases the, the likelihood of death. Um, a, a relative risk under one means that it's uh, decreasing the risk of death. And um, one means it doesn't have any effect. So what's interesting here is that we're seeing a clear relationship between mortality and, and income, where as income rises, the likelihood of dying goes down. Now, I should have said that, that, we're, that there are actually three different uh, models here. One is uh, uh, a model for all of the men starting at age 70. So that's both the early and late retire, retirees. This uh, middle set of columns is for the men, only the men who retired at age 70. And this is for the men who retired at age, uh, between age 65 and 69. This one does include their experience between 65 and 69, but when I include them with the other men, I, I start them all at age 70, so it, it, it's, it's only including the, the experience. And, you know, when you compare the two, the, the relationship between mortality and income, these are two separate groups, but the, the, uh, the relative risk is identical. So it's, uh, well, we're, it's not the, you know, the, the health that, that's, that's affecting it. Um, there are, but the early retirement does matter. Um, if, you com if we compare the uh, mortality above age 70, those who retired at, the, at their own request um, are about 27% 20, more likely to die. Um, and those who retired at, at early because of the supervisor request are 40% more, more likely to die. So early retirement is, is this mixed thing. It does, while there's some choice involved, it, it also does involve, uh, some of the men are clearly uh, uh, unhealthy. And here, when we look only at those who retired early, we can see that uh, those who retired at supervisor request, again, were more likely to die than those who retired uh, at their own request. Another interesting aspect of this is that when earnings are controlled, the occupational categories don't make a difference. Uh, so you can see here that these things are not statistically significant until you get to this one. And what happens is that there is also a penalty paid by the unskilled. So even controlling for earnings, the unskilled have in, in the combined uh, regression, uh, more than 10%, they're more than 10% more likely to die than the, um, than the other occupations. But controlling for occupation, the difference between you know, a professional, a manager, manager, and so on, or an engineer and a conductor, those, those things are, all don't matter because we've controlled for that with the earnings. So the earnings is, uh, really are a, a powerful indicator in in this data set. What I've done here is, this comes from another regression, uh, Cox regression, but um, in which I've uh, grouped the earnings the way they were grouped in the earlier uh, figures here. So that, because some, I don't always trust, you know, uh, a single variable to see what's going on. And what this shows is very clearly from here to here that the decreasing mortality with increasing income. Um, it's, it, it's very clear. So um, the, this dashed blue line is for the men who retire early. And you can see the trend it, it, there. The, the uh, red line is the men who retire at age 70, and the green line is, is all of them. 
and it's all the same trend. Now, what's happening over here and, and in here is, is that we've got smaller, small numbers, so there's a lot of noise. But in the, the central part of the income distribution, higher income means longer lives. So um, what we've seen, you know, in summary, is that the higher incomes are correlated with longer survival after retirement, that uh, early retirement is this combined thing. Um, so there clearly are uh, men who are taking the early retirement because they are, they are sick and can't work anymore. But there's also um, a, a uh, but some of them, you know, as, as we saw, our uh, retirement is, is a choice. And finally, um, the unskilled workers, the laborers, are, um, have exceptional mortality, even, even controlling for their incomes. So uh, I don't have final conclusions. This is uh, uh, a new project, but um, I'll give you uh, some, some I, you know, ideas or, or really questions. You know. So in this data set, you, know, you have to ask, what is it that people are doing? How is it that income buys a longer life? Um, some of the things that have been suggested in, in this context are better environments. You could live in a, in a better neighborhood, um, a healthier neighborhood. Um, it might be that there might be an intergenerational effect here. It might be that skilled workers in this generation were the children of skilled workers in a previous generation, and maybe they had a, uh, a better start in life. Um, there's one can certainly argue that there was less stress, you know. Um, so I, I remember when I was a kid, people always talked about um, how much stress there was for executives. But I think that the stress that executives feel is nothing compared to the stress that poor, poorly paid workers feel. You know, it's much more stressful worrying about whether you can feed your children and pay for your for your your home than it is to worry about you know, how well the business is going to do. And, and the research on this, as I understand it, shows that the people who feel the most stress are people who are in jobs where they don't have control. And if you're in, a, in an executive position, sure, there's stress, but you're in control, and that, and that matters a lot. So it, um, this, is, this data set certainly is, is consistent with that. What I think is uh, less important in this data set, frankly, is, is medical care. Be, um, because the interventions that uh, physicians could do probably had less effect on the things that these men are, are dying from. Um, and then we actually have uh, an interesting puzzle about this uh, camel-shaped uh, uh, um, distribution of when uh, men took early retirement, where on, on the one hand we've got these a peak at the very uh, smallest average earnings of men who are probably uh, already being disabled and not not earning uh, very much, but then you know an increase to uh, incomes around eighty or ninety dollars a month, and then a then a, just a, re a, a a very rapid decrease above that. Um, and so it's hard to describe this in, with a, a, a single model. Um, on the one hand, we might expect in this population what you might, uh, a backward bending supply curve of labor that as the incomes, um, you know, their incomes rise to a certain point, they can afford to take to retire early. And of course, their pensions are rising with with, with their earnings. So um, that's, I think, explains why it goes, why uh, early retirement goes up with, with earnings. Um, but why does it go back down again? Why don't the men who are really well paid take their pay and, and, um, and uh, retire early as well? And there it's a little harder to explain. I think that um, in thinking about it, I've got um, 
two kinds of uh, explanations that might be involved. One, I think, is probably a, a, a reference group uh, thing, that, that the men who are professionals and high executives and high managers are probably comparing their lifestyle to, uh, to each other and not to the machinists and the painters and the carpenters. Um, but I suspect that the conductors and the and the other highly paid, you know, workers in who are around in this peak around eighty or ninety dollars are comparing themselves to others, other working class men, and they are clearly at the peak of peak of that. So it might be uh, a reference group phenomenon that there are re there are different preferences in the middle of the distribution and the the top of the distribution. The other thing is there might be some characteristics of these occupations that uh, incline men to retire early. Um, I'm not sure what they are, but uh, one thing that is true about the conductors and the engineers is that they are the ones whose occupations involve being on these trains and sometimes you know, getting up um, you know, early in the morning to get the train out and getting home late at night and working your regular hours. Um, whereas if you're, you know, uh, a machinist or a carpenter or, uh, or, most of the, or a clerk or a, or a ticket agent, you're working regular hours. So maybe they just get tired of it and uh, wanna, want to, you know, stay at home and sleep through, through the night on a regular basis. Um, so it might be that there are characteristics of those occupations and also characteristics of, of the, you know, the unskilled occupations uh, who are, which, which are both in terms of incomes more, more stressful and, and in terms of the wear and tear on their bodies perhaps uh, more difficult. So these are, you know, just are uh, some initial thoughts about this and I'm, uh, welcome uh, any comments that and help that people can have in helping us explain this. So, thank you.